Welcome to the Onside Podcast. We're here to share stories about innovation-driven entrepreneurship, inspire others, share knowledge, and build a community here in Atlantic Canada. Hello, you guys are listening to the Onside Podcast, the podcast for innovation-driven entrepreneurship here in Atlantic Canada. We're building a community, inspiring others, and starting a revolution around innovation-driven entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Alex McCann, and this is our fourth episode. So thanks so much for joining us. Our guest today is Gabrielle Massoni, founder and CEO of Colorsmith Labs. We're so excited to have you here on our podcast, Gabrielle. Thank you, Alex. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, we're going to get into your story and talk a little bit about what Colorsmith does. Um, but I thought maybe we could just start off with a little bit of a, an introduction to our listeners um, about you. Can you share a little bit, uh, a little bit about yourself with us? Yeah, absolutely. So I moved to Halifax in 2014 to go to school at Dalhousie, where I studied chemistry. I really was only intending to come here for university, but I was so inspired by the city that I stayed and decided that this is where I wanted to lay roots and start a company. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, is it okay if our listeners know where you came from? Yeah, absolutely. I'm proud of it. I am from Detroit, Michigan. Love, love to hear that story. We like to to hear about where people are from and how they made their uh, journey to this uh, this part of Canada. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, our our podcast uh, is about innovation driven entrepreneurship, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through our podcast today. But we've been asking most of our guests. You know, what do they think innovation driven entrepreneurship means and how is that maybe a little bit different from your traditional um, small, medium size uh, entrepreneurship? Do you have an idea of around, you know, how you would describe innovation driven entrepreneurship? So in my opinion, I think that if it's an innovation centric company, it means that you really are having to get quite creative to solve a problem. So I think it just stems from that sense of creativity. I think there are some great business models wherein you recognize a problem and directly address it, you know, but I think when it comes to innovation driven or innovation centric um, entrepreneurship, you, you have to get quite creative to solve that problem. You have to really understand the problem in depth. And so I think in that sense, you need a lot more support. So Colorsmith being an innovation-driven company, you know, we wouldn't be able to have ever made it to this point had we not had, you know, a whole team of people supporting uh, from the outside what it was, what it is that we're doing. Yeah, I like that. I like that. You know, it's something that uh, this idea around innovation-driven entrepreneurship uh, is a I wouldn't say a new conversation, but is is fairly new. So it's really interesting how different um, companies and peoples and leaders talk about this. And it's something that we're excited to uh, get your perspective on and hear from from other leaders that are in our area. Yeah, definitely. I'm very excited that you're focusing on it as well. Good. It's awesome. Good. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I thought maybe because your company is uh, a, a pretty innovative company and something that's new uh, and you have a lot of interesting and novel uh, technology that you're working on. So I thought, mm. why don't you share a little bit with us um, about what Colorsmith Labs does or what it is? Yeah, for sure. Um, always happy to talk about the company. It, I, I still to this day find it super inspiring. So, uh, okay. So Colorsmith, we started off being a company that was, we recognized that there was a problem in the market and that there are, are there glasses that let colorblind people have functional color vision. Um, what really spoke to me was the impact that those glasses had on people. You'll see these YouTube videos of people crying and just extreme emotional reaction to being able to visualize and have more functional color vision. I found that so inspiring having, you know, my own vision problems really impact my life and the way I grew up that I thought, you know, what would be great is to have this mode of action applied to something that was less obvious than glasses. So, you know, contact lenses, it would be nice to be able to wear contact lenses um, that were non-tinted. You'd be able to go on dates, go to school, have that functional color vision taken to the next level. That was hugely inspiring to me and that idea. And so I wanted to drive that into a company. 
to address that problem, we realized that, you know, to get the optical filters uh, that are these, you know, these wonderful, this wonderful mechanism, optical filtration, which allows you to separate color receptors and normalize your color vision. You know, we recognized that 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 technology needed to be integrated into contact lenses. And when we stumbled upon that, we realized a much bigger problem. Not only could, you know, that specific, you know, color enhancement optical filter not be integrated into contact lenses, but no optical filters could be integrated into contact lenses. Um, This is where, you know, I'm going to draw it back to what we just talked about, the innovation-driven entrepreneurship and where the support was needed. This ended up being a much larger problem than we knew how to address. So, you know, pulling in, I mean, technical support from the National Research Council, Dalhousie, St. Mary's University, St. FX, you know, coming up with that first proof of concept design for Uh, chemical encapsulation that could move these optical filtering materials into contact lenses. That that really, I mean, that took a huge amount of external support. And when we did hit proof of concept and were able to get the color enhancement contact lenses, you know, in prototype form, I mean, it was a huge milestone for us. And uh, the company has transformed since then to say, you know, why just focus on optical filters for color blindness? Let's focus on all types of optical filters. There's so many, there's so many different diseases and applications that this technology could be used to, and you know, and help millions at the end of the day. So that's, you know, I, I find this innovation driven entrepreneurship. I think it takes spirited efforts um, by a huge number of people to actually make happen. And so I'm super happy to have stumbled into a position where I get to be, you know, experiencing that firsthand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's great. And we we definitely need people who are um, open minded and, and risk takers to to try that, because you're right. You know, with innovation driven entrepreneurship, you're you're trying to solve a really big problem, you know, solve mm-hmm. a really big problem that has a, a, a large global market uh, that needs to be addressed um, and find solutions to those those kinds of problems, whether it's vision care related or healthcare related, the opportunity to make uh, deep impacts in people's lives is can, can be huge. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's really, really important that we have uh, people focusing on this. Yeah. And important too, if, you know, if they have, if people have the time, the, you know, the, the the guts they should because um, you know it's it's definitely something that uh, could solve a lot of world problems if um, you know if people d- dedicated more time to it in my opinion mm, yeah that's true yeah. that's true so um, you seem super passionate about uh, vision care and I, I do know I believe you told me that you have a background in uh, chemistry <gasps> um, so you have the the technical expertise and confidence um, to to pursue this and and go after this particular area of focus around developing new filters for for vision uh, enhancement and care. But but what kind of inspired you to to go down this path? I think you might have mentioned just really quickly your own experience. What what inspired you to um, to go down this path? That's so that's a really great question. I mean, honestly, what started it was. I've struggled with my own vision my whole life. So when I was a super little kid, um, I had a condition which went undiagnosed called amblyopia, which essentially means that the connection between your eyes and your brain, uh, they don't really speak, uh, they don't really speak the way they should. Um, so what your brain will do is in a situation like that, you know, it cuts its losses and it will shut down one of your eyes. By the time that you know you're no longer plastic so when you kind of hit age eight nine ten you know you start to become more hardwired so that communication between your eyes and your brain solidifies to a degree and it's very hard to regain that vision Mm -hmm. so that's exactly what happened to me mine wasn't caught until you know well past the point of um you know, me having gone partly blind. Wow. Um, So as a kid, yeah. Um, So as if that's not bad enough, the treatment for that is to actually cover up your good eye. So I had already gone so, you know, severe in the eye that didn't function. 
that when they covered up my good eye, I, I essentially had no vision. And I lived like that all through elementary school and then even through a little bit of, of middle school as well, which was very difficult. It meant that I had to do, you know, all that foundational, you know, education, math, science, um, you know, English, spelling, how to write, like all of that was, I couldn't see wow. for all of that. Yeah. And it was extremely hard, not just, not just to make my way through school, which my parents were extremely, you know, strict about do good in school. That was their only rule. But, you know, so not only was it difficult to achieve that, but it was also ex- incredibly difficult, you know, socially, like I couldn't, I couldn't see people. I couldn't make friends as much. Like it was, you know, takes a huge hit on the confidence. And so when I, when the patch came off and I could see again, you know, yeah, I couldn't see out of the one eye, but I had learned so many skills and how to work around vision Mm -hmm. that I was able to do, you know, I was able to excel in high school. I was able to excel in university, but you know, I, I am weirdly thankful for that time in my life because it did leave me in a position where, you know, I, I had to work incredibly hard to do basic things. And um, that is, you know, I think I carry through that value to this day. So I'm happy it happened. But, you know, I do miss that eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, many of us would remember, or at least I do, you know, uh kids in school that had the eye patch or, you know, yeah. trying to work some through some of those some of those issues. But uh, I think that uh, you you've come out on the other side uh, stronger, maybe even than um, than uh, than we one could have hoped. So uh, it's great that yeah. you've been able to sort of find a, a good or positive light out of uh, something so difficult and probably something that many people uh, may may continue to struggle with as they as they yeah. go through their life. At least I, you know, I do have the skill to now wake up in the middle of the night and walk around uh, without tripping on stuff. So that's nice. I don't have to put on the lights. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will add this to my list of zombie apocalypse skills that people yeah. have. Yeah, I, exactly. I keep this little list of people who, who have interesting skills. So Call that'll be around. your... Call me if you're going into a dark cave during a zombie apocalypse. I gotcha. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So um, I think another thing that you had mentioned, uh, you know, when us talking before was that, you know, as a result of your uh, issues with vision, uh, but, you know, working really hard in school and, and studying and, and uh, you know, focusing on sciences that you had actually thought about becoming an optometrist. Mm-hmm. Um so what what happened there? And then why did you decide not to become an optometrist? So great, great question. I still would love to be an optometrist secretly. I it's I, I love the lifestyle. Um, I've never met an optometrist who I didn't like. I, I think it's like a wonderful and noble profession. The reason why I didn't go for it is because the company... Uh, the company started at the same time. So I hit a crossroads uh, in my life where I said, okay, I either go to optometry school or I go and start a company. Very, very tough decision. But what really ultimately, um, you know, the decision was kind of made for me by, you know, looking at the impact. So with both the company and with the optometry, you know, paths, both of those meant that I could help people with their vision. I could help people, you know, see things that they couldn't see before. I could help give people that quality of life back, you know, which is so inspiring to me. And that's always still been my goal. But the difference is with this company, I get to work behind the scenes and help far more people than I would ever have the bandwidth to do in person as an optometrist. I think, you know, 10, 15 years from now, um, you know, with when the company, you know, ends up like exiting or being successful um, or whatever happens, maybe they replace me with someone who's, you know, (laughs) a little bit more, um, a little bit more mature possibly. (laughs) But once all of that, uh, once all of that, you know, happens, I I do, um, I'm still always going to be involved in optometry uh, in some ways. So it's, it's still something that means so much to me. Mm, Interesting. Interesting. And, and the idea for Colorsmith, did you have you, uh, my, my understanding is that you had been doing some interesting research that had come about that was, that was quite novel and, um, was, was a bit new. And so that was kind of the impetus for you to think about, you know, change, you know, using that as the basis for your, for your company. How did, how did that come about? Well, so 
honestly, encapsulation technologies, I find fascinating on just a chemistry, from just a chemistry perspective, I find them very, very fascinating. So it's, it's a relatively new field that's being applied to medicine. Um, so you see encapsulation happening a lot in drug release, which is where we first looked at that encapsulation, a drug release encapsulation. And we had said, you know, that's incredibly interesting. And, you know, a lot of work is done to try to get these molecules within the encapsulate to release over time. But what if you didn't release them? What if that encapsulate instead acted as a coating that held these, you know, materials inside and didn't let them come out? In a situation like building these optical filters, the problem with, you know, the dyes that make up these optical filters, um, so literally dyes, like actual, like, you know, like dyes that you would tie dye your clothes with. Like the problem with that is that mm. they don't have the functionality to remain in contact lenses. Uh, they will fall out. They are not biocompatible. There's a whole bunch of problems with them. So instead of trying to create, you know, thousands of new dyes that are useful, I, you know, I had said, I proposed, why don't we encapsulate and just, you know, use that as a, you know, bioprotective coating that provides the functionalization so they can stay in contact lenses. That was, that was first, you know, that was recognized from uh, scientific research put forward through Princeton University. And um, I had just applied it instead of a release mechanism, a containment mechanism. And that mm. was the vision I scientifically had for the team. And um, since then, I mean, it it was, you know, I'm happy I started off with that <laughs> proposition because that ended up being the right answer. We, we were able to develop that. And so now we're working with, you know, very specialized dyes um, that we're containing in these contact lenses. So unique, never been used before for these applications, like incredible optical filtering materials that are just, you know, they have the potential to completely disrupt the industry. And uh, we're just allowing them to shine in contact lenses for the first time. Awesome. That's yeah. that's so cool. That's so cool. So so I know, um, you know, you kind of um, got started with this idea around creating Collarsmith here in uh, in Halifax. Mm -hmm. And you have worked with a lot of interesting players. Uh, you have pitched at Volta, and uh, which is a tech incubator here in, in Halifax. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about what you had to do to kind of prepare for your very first um, Volta competition? Like, what, yeah. what was that like? Oh, I, I love this story. Okay, so when I, <laughs> so I had just, just decided that, you know, I was going to try this thing they call entrepreneurship. Um, I didn't even want to call myself an entrepreneur at that point. I still don't, but like, especially then I was like, ah, like, you know, I, I haven't earned my stripes. I don't know if I'm even cut out for this. So um, one of my advisors had said, you know, start, just try to pitch at the Volta cohort competition. Like if you can manage to do well in that, then, you know, the decision is kind of made for you because they do give you the seed money that you can, you know, leverage into more and actually kick off your, kick off your proof of concept or whatever, be that first stage that kicks off your company. So I had said, okay, all right, I'm ready. I, let's let's go and do this. I thought I could wing it. <laughs> I, I, you know, true, true, you know, Gabby fashion. I was like, you know, I bet I could wing it. I, I like talking. This will be fine. So I ended up, um, so I ended up, uh, luckily, Volta did a little pitch rehearsal. So it was like a five minute pitch to just a small number of people. You get up there and you pitch your company. So I get up there. I'm thinking I'm fine. I can memorize my speech. I'm all good. Uh, I bombed. Like I bombed so hard. It was so <laughs> embarrassing. Like it was so, it was so embarrassing to have so many people staring at me and I couldn't even think of like my own name, let alone the company name. Like I, I, I was freaked out. So I walked away and my friend, uh, my buddy was just like, you know, uh, so that wasn't great. And I was like, OK, all right. I it, like, you know, game game over. I have to really like try here. This is not going to be just one of those things I can wing. So I spent the next week and a half um, say I, I don't think I spoke words outside of that speech. I wrote down that speech and 
just had it memorized. I was like singing it in the shower. I was saying it in funny voices. Like I, I just, you know, I had to lock it down to the point where it was like second nature. I could still do the speech to this day, by the way. That's how ingrained it was. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, no, it's crazy. But um, yeah, so I, you know, I was like, yep. Uh, and then when I got to that point, I was like, but it needs something more, you know, now that I felt confident with that, I'm like, you know, I got to do something. I got to do something memorable. Like, it's not enough. Like, so I was like, okay, what are we doing here? We're, we're, we're taking, you know, people who can't see in color. We're letting them see in color. You know, what does that feel like to me? It feels like a magic trick. I'm going to do a magic trick. I got this. Uh, I told my advisor, he he turned green. He was like, don't, are you crazy? Don't do that. Um, <laughs> I, told, I told my other advisor, you know, and I mean, at this point, like these people are just like, they, there isn't even a company, right? Like they're, they're just, you know, telling some kid not to get on stage in front of a thousand people and do a magic trick. But I didn't listen. Um, I was like, no, I gotta do this. Call up a magic shop in Toronto, get them to express ship me. Um, you know, magic tricks having to do with color. I'm like on the phone with this guy and he's so excited. He's like going through his magic stock. Like he's sending me a whole bunch of packages of like, you know, colorful ribbons and flowers and all this crazy stuff. So I get this big package shipped to my apartment and I'm going through it, showing them to my sister, which one would work. She picks this like magic scarf and I was like, great, I'm going to do this in front of everyone. So I get up on stage at the Volta competition and I, um, and I did the pitch, like I, I nailed, like I felt like I nailed it. I kind of, you know, went into second nature mode, but I did the trick and uh, I could see my advisor in the audience just like head go into hands, but everyone else really liked it. He ended up liking it too. <laughs> he ended up being like, okay, that was cool. But you know, like at the time it was like, oh, just nerves. Right. Um, but yeah, no. And it ended up being like, ended up being talked about like it was interesting and like people thought it was different and people sometimes they want to show like depending on the format of the event sometimes they just want to be interested and they want to feel inspired in the same way that you're inspired and like I'm I'm kind of a kooky person sometimes so that's just very in keeping with who I am and I'm I'm happy that you know I at least preface this whole company with showing people a little bit of my own like style um in at least the first big exposition of what it was that we're doing yeah I think I yeah. think that that's great I think that's great I mean I think that you know obviously you are uh, growing your company you're raising funds you know you you're getting uh, some good traction there so clearly you have the the a bright idea uh, and you have the the passion and a little bit of showmanship. It sounds like to <laughs> to, uh, to make yourself distinguish. So I think that that's uh, I think that's great. Yeah. And if you're gonna uh, do it, you gotta have fun. Yeah, yeah. If you're if yeah. you're if it's uh, you know, I know those things can be super stressful. So uh, a little levity sometimes helps. <laughs> that's great. <Yeah. laughs> so um, you know. You you talked about your competition. You talked about all these things you've done. Um, you know, I know that you're a you're a soul founder. Uh, mm -hmm. You're also a, a female soul founder, um, yes. and you you're a, a, a female founder who is focused in a STEM field. And mm -hmm. you're also, um, I think that there are maybe a few now, but I think that you may have been one of the early. Um, female founders that have made it to Creative Destruction Lab Atlantic, yes. uh, which is a super, I've been to it, I, I would describe it as a super intense um, uh, accelerator um, with uh, entrepreneurs and other leaders in various industries to kind of help very promising companies reach their potential quicker mm -hmm. um, and uh, to get some support there. Um, you know, can you, can you, you know, talk a little bit about that experience? Like, is, is it a bit lonely, uh, to be a sole female, um, founder and entrepreneur in a STEM field? Mm, so, so Creative Destruction Labs, first off, is a total game changer. So I'll just start off by saying that as far as like being lonely, I, I don't know, I, I, 
I think too much to ever really feel lonely, to be honest. So <laughs> either about the company or life or something. So I never, I'm always, uh, always have friends in my head at least. So I never felt super lonely through that program, but I did, uh, I mean, it was, it was a, um, it was an opportunity to be the entrepreneur that you need to be right. So, so what they'll do is they'll put you through, um, I mean, it, they'll put you through some, some tough programming. They'll, they'll put you in front of some tough people. Um, they'll have you, you know, you have to know every ounce of your company back front forward. What are your plans? Be ready to be critiqued. But if you're in there and you are fully ready to absorb the information and, you know, be coachable and make changes, my God, like you walk out you walk out of there like a completely different, you know, different perspective on the company, so much tighter, so much better form, you know, and, and yeah, so I mean, thick, it definitely gives you thick skin. And if you, I mean, if it doesn't give you thick skin, then, you know, you had thick skin going in because it is not, uh, it's, it's definitely not for the faint of heart, but I would, I would do it a million times more. I think it was probably one of the most pivotal, pivotal, like, programs that I've been through that helped accelerate the company. I didn't even have a second to stop and breathe to realize that I was, you know, the only sole female founder in STEM in that entire program. Like that was not, you know, that wasn't something that struck me until after the fact, after I went through and made it through to super session. But yeah, I mean, there was pride certainly after the fact and realizing like, oh, wow, that was that was pretty cool. Like that, you know, I was just so focused on the race. I didn't stop to look at, you know, who was standing next to me. But, um, you know, once I did, I was, I was, you know, it was an honor. It made me even more proud to, you know, be in a position mm-hmm. I'm in to have, you know, to have achieved that. So like, yeah. And, and being the support you get through that program, like I, I couldn't even, couldn't even tell you night and day. Mm-hmm. Colorsmith is mm-hmm. night and day after. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think you've been able to get some good advisors and and uh, who've who've uh, supported you uh, beyond uh, your CDL experience as well. Oh, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, our entire pre-seed round was CDL, uh, primarily CDL based, and um, just just fantastic. Like you have you have people from VC firms in that room that are smart. And, you know, they're, they're where they are because they're, they're smart. They know what they're doing. And, you know, you're at a loss if you don't listen to them. Like, so just, you know, sit down, listen to what they have to say. They're, you know, they've, they've made every mistake you are going to make or have made. So, you know, why, you know, why keep reinventing the wheel? Just like sit down with them and learn from them. Um, Rhiannon Davis, who I think at some point you need to have on the show because she is absolutely inspiring. Mm-hmm. She's fantastic. Uh, she's got a great story. I met her through CDL, and uh, now she is an advisor at Colorsmith as well as a board member. Wade Daw, who like stuck it out with me from day one um, at CDL. Um, you know the and then we have like kill it capital is fantastic like there there are just there are so many i can't even start jim spats like there are so many different people that i met through that program that still you know if i'm ever feeling low or ever feel unsupported i just you know knowing that they're there knowing i can lean on them makes me feel um sane again which i really i really really love so they're fantastic that whole program is fantastic and i mean being a sole female founder to go through it I didn't, I didn't look up to realize that that was the case until, until it was all over. But, you know, I, it's, I guess it's just evident. Like, I mean, if, Hey, if I can do it, you can do it. Right. Like (laughs) seriously, just work very hard, have an open mind and respect, like respect these people who have so much to offer. No, that's great. Well, that's great. You know, I think, you know, at Onside, you know, one of the things we are focused on is around inclusive innovation. And I think your message is super inspiring to lots of other people who are out there, you know, who are looking to, to blaze their own trail or find their own path. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's, that's some, some really good perspective. Are are there any other things you think that um, not, not specifically related to, to CDL, but just sort of in general, are there other things that you think could be done to foster more women in STEM or uh, more underrepresented groups in, in some of these fields? Cause we, you know, we're, it's something that, uh, you know, we're taking a mind towards which is that 
you know, innovation and entrepreneurship should be uh, the opportunity to pursue it should be accessible to as many people as possible. Yes. Have you thought about that? Yeah, I actually have. So I, I think it needs to make its way into people's values more. So so I don't know if it's as much that you, you know, I think people starting companies who, you know, are uh, underrepresented. I think that that comes secondary to the companies that are already established or the programs that are available, the people, the support networks, the community, the ecosystem puts it in their values first that they want to support underrepresented people. And then as a result, underrepresented people will start coming forward and, you know, saying that, yeah, you know what, I feel like I can do this. Like you obviously believe in me enough that this has made it into your values. Like I'm, I'm here, I'm ready to go. Mm. So I think that that's the first step. As far as groups that are doing that, man, like Halifax still impresses me to this, you know, to this day, the things that are popping up. So Atlantic Women's Venture Fund, awesome. ACOA is always supportive of, you know, you know, people who are upper, uh, underrepresented, like hugely supportive, uh, hugely, hugely supportive. The National Research Council, like also hugely supportive. There's There's programming that, you know, is specifically, you know, trying to drive people from uh, who are underrepresented uh, underrepresented in the entrepreneurship ecosystem to come forward and to establish companies. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely happening, but I think the more it fits into people's, you know, the more it fits into the values, the more it's going to drive, you know, a, an awakening of, of just people with great ideas to come out and just, you know, put a stake in the ground and say, here, here's what I care about. Here's what I'm going to create. Like, look out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just uh, give people a little space and then they'll they'll have the opportunity to to shine and to show what they what show what they can do. Yeah. Encouragement. Yeah. I mean, you got to you got to plant a seed to see it grow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's yeah. really good. You know, one thing you you mentioned some supportive folks in the ecosystem that have helped you or helped uh, uh, Colorsmith grow. And, you know, sometimes companies in Atlantic Canada in general, and then maybe more specifically female founders, for example, who are, who are seeking funding, uh, find some difficulty in being able to, you know, attract funding, even if they have great CEOs like you, uh, have a demonstrated value with their company. You know, what have, what have been some things that you've been able to do um, to, to, attract funding um, in this kind of environment? Are there are there certain things that um, that you've been able to do? I think that would definitely be of interest to our, our listeners. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So to answer this question, I'm going to reel you right back to like, you know, what I learned is step one in, in the business, which is, you know, your business model. Um, when you're looking at, you know, your company, you're saying, okay, there is a problem that exists in the world and I'm going to solve it in this way. I think that you need to apply. I think that's a great, just general lesson. So listen first, act second. I think that's a fantastic general lesson for everything. And I've used that lesson in funding. Um, that's, that's how, that's my philosophy when it comes to funding is listen to what people want to support and then apply for funding for specifically that thing. So, you know, there's there's a lot of funding out there to, for example, a lot of funding to hire people. So you see a lot of wage subsidies, people trying to encourage you to hire young, get youth, you know, get youth in through the door, get them working, like get them, you know, uh, get them the skills they need to really excel in their life. So that's, you know, I recognize that and I had said, okay, so they want to fund youth. I need employees. I should hire youth. But what does that mean? It means that they're going to come in unskilled. They're going to need to learn a lot. There's going to be a massive learning curve. Like it could be tough. So I dedicated infrastructure to taking people who, you know, maybe didn't start off having the skills, but you know, you develop them into people who have the skills and you use that kind of funding in your favor. You know, we had our whole original chemistry team had started off um, as, you know, students and since then have, you know, either graduated or are close to graduating and are, are doing really miraculous stuff. See, the thing is, is like you don't want to invent too, too much. You mostly just want to understand the science that's out there and apply it to your technology. And you don't need a, you know, 
a super PhD to do that all the time. Sometimes you just need that base foundational team of people who are hungry, um, scientifically competent and ready to go. So that was, you know, recognizing that there were grants out there to support people like that, recognizing that I was going to be doing good for the region by actually enacting that, and then moving these people and giving them the skills into the company, putting their names on patents, like getting them getting them skilled up and ready to go. I mean, they're they're fantastic. Like they're they're in the lab currently right now. You know, we just had Scrum this morning. Um, they're in the lab right now, you know, actually working with commercial contact lens materials, which had been shipped over by a partner um, and integrating additives directly into these lenses to do our first ever pilot project. You know, yeah, like I, I could have gone by the book and hired a bunch of, you know, uh, MSCs, PhDs, um, and there is some funding for that. But, you know, I wanted to I wanted to raise a team. Yeah. So that's what I did. That's great. Well, I think, you know, you're yeah. you're you're uh, doing many things, leading a team, building a team, building capacity and finding mm-hmm. ways to do that and to bring people along, which I think is uh, is really important as you grow your your company and grow those values that you were that you were talking about. So that's that's really key. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yeah, we talked a lot about your your company and your journey and you know some ups and downs and twists and turns what what's something that happened along the way that you thought might have derailed you um, or brought you some despair uh, as you've been on this this journey and how did you overcome that <laughs> you mean every day <laughs> 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 um, it's pretty much like a daily occurrence at this point. I mean, I would say, yeah, okay. I, I do have a fun story for you. So we had, I mean, you know, like, not going to bring up this question without talking about COVID, right? So I'll tell you my COVID story. Um, we had a, we had a patent that we had to file in the, like this year. So May 24th, our patent was due. When I say a patent is due, I mean like this isn't some homework assignment in high school. You have to, you know, yeah, ask for an extension, yada, yada. No, like it's it's due on that day. It's due on that day. If they don't have it filed, that's it. Like your patent's gone. All that money you spent on the provisional gone. You've placed prior arts against yourself. Like you're done. So like that was not that was not something I was willing to, you know, that was not some, like I've driven the team since day one to value that patent. Guys, like this patent needs to get filed on this day. You know, that's what we're working towards. So uh, everything was fine. April, all of the study, or sorry, March, all of the studies are going to plan. Um, Then March 15th rolls around, you know, NBA down, like, you know, everything starts shutting down. The president, the prime minister, like they're both on the news, like, you know, it just start, it started getting really real. Mm. And I was freaking out because I was like, man, if we lose this facility that we're in, um, you know, Dalhousie just shut down. That was, that was one of our big research collaborators. I was like, okay, well, whew, like we could do with the loss of Dalhousie, but we can't lose this facility. What are we going to do? So I'm calling around like a maniac, right? Like trying to find like another place for us to move into some place where I have the keys in my hand and I'm not going to, you know, let those go. Nothing. Like literally everywhere, it, it was the same situation everywhere you go. Like it's, you know, if the government shuts down, the government shuts down. So I'm like, shoot, where are we safe? Um, sat down with the team and we p- came up with a COVID contingency and basically it said, all right, like what what is it that we have to do to get this patent filed? Like really slim down everything to just the bare essentials. What do we need done? The work that we had left, fortunately, was all prototype work. So we were like, okay, prototype work can be done in, in a garage. Like you don't need some fancy chem facility to do that. Let's go ahead and get ourselves to that point. So we, you know, we did the project planning and realized that we had one week before any potential, you know, risk of COVID shutting everybody down to build, get this, 150 lens prototypes. Wow. That's contact lenses. That's also spectacle lenses or eyeglass lenses. And we were like, all right, like, let's get to work. These these guys, like this team was pulling shifts. I, 
like weekend shifts, night shifts, like we were just around the clock building prototypes. When we finally finished, we took all the prototypes and we took all of the, you know, not all of the equipment, but most of the equipment that we needed to my apartment, <laughs> to my apartment, which I had kitted out, um, a, you know, the week before to be a fully functioning, like, you know, prototype testing facility. So moved out all my couches, moved out all the pictures and everything on the walls, like laid down what I had to lay down, just ready to turn that place into, you know, a place where we can test prototypes, where we can do, you know, an ethanol extraction or where we can do, you know, photo bleaching resistance studies. And just to get the data packages that we needed to send over to the patent attorneys to get this patent filed, that team was incredible. Like that, I think that is really the value in finding people who are young, hungry, and, you know, is is they they want this to succeed as well. Like I sat down with them and I said, guys, we have you know, before we even decided to to go into my living room to do this testing, I was like, you know, guys, we've got fork in the road here. Are we going to file this patent or are we going to call it, you know, are we going to, you know, do what everyone else is doing and just like, you know, sit this one out until COVID clears up. And they were like, no, no, no freaking way. Like we're not closing up. Like we're, we're here. We're ready to go. So, I mean, decision, decision made small tear from me, just so happy and so proud. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, that, I mean, big conclusion of the story. We got the data sets, the patent was filed. Like we're, you know, we're going to go into the national phase, like, you know, it, like within the next year, I'm I'm super pumped about it. And that team, just so inspiring. Like you know, as if as if there wasn't already enough that inspired me about this company. Now the team, like the team, is just you know so surprise, like just surprising, and and they're fantastic. Like I just love that you were running experiments in your in your apartment. Yeah, I, love that. <laughs> I send you. I'll send you some of the pictures. Like it was you know all safety. I did all the safety checks first. Like made sure that everyone was going to be one hundred percent safe. And like we had we had our you know. Um, we had it cleared by like our head safety uh, person at the company. So we were good. But at the same time, yeah, it was it was truly just like we needed a garage. We don't have garages because this is Halifax. No one has a garage. So, you know, living room it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like yeah. it. I like the tenacity. Yeah. So, OK, so uh, your story is pretty unique. And just based on what you just told me about your scrappiness is entrepreneurship nature or nurture? What do you think? Yeah. So that's a really, really good question. I do think that, I think it's probably a bit of both. Like you, I think the nature is ingrained in everybody. There is something that everybody cares about enough to drive them to do something with, you know, it's just, it's, you got to find that, that thing that really inspires you. It's my belief that everybody has it, you know, it's just a matter of discovering it. So I think that's, that's where it comes from a nature perspective, but you know, from a nurture perspective, oh my, you know, not everyone has the nurture. That's, that's where it really, that's where it really starts to delineate because, you know, especially, you know, going back to, to what you were, what we were discussing earlier about innovation driven entrepreneurship, you need that nurture. Like no one comes in to, you know, teach you how to do this. And, you know, so you just, you got to pick up, you got to be scrappy, pick up bits and pieces wherever you can be organized enough to compile it into an overall message and, and a philosophy that you have care enough to be doing it at two in the morning. Like it's, but I think that's there. I think if you care enough, it's there. Like, you know, you see people who get really invested in projects, you know, hobbies or projects or, you know, like a cold case or something like that. Like you see these people get really into it. In my opinion, there's no difference. That's that same kind of drive. It's just, you know, mine happens to be a thing that, you know, we hope to, you know, make a make money off one day. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's not bad either. That's not bad yeah, either. Okay, the investors great. would agree. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, we're getting close to, to the end of our time here. But uh, one one final question is, if you could turn back time, what would you say to yourself 10 years ago? So yourself today, looking back to tell yourself you know. When I was 19, let me see, let me yeah. go right back. Wow. Well, it was, yeah, 
19 year old Gabby, <laughs> I really would have told her to uh, go back to class. But yeah, that was, you know, I, if I if I did have to, um, if I wanted to teach myself one lesson, then um, it probably would have been to care about something to to find something that you care about and and push it to the extreme. You know, I always cared about uh, vision. And even at 19, I was, you know, I was either, I can't remember at 19, I was either volunteering for or working for the CNIB, the not, not, not driven enough. Like it, I was still more interested in figuring out who I was. And I think that was an important thing to do, but I mean, what, what a wasted opportunity. Like I could have at 19, I could have been focusing on, um, ways to improve the state of vision care like I like I am now, you know, if I could go back, I would have just said, you know, hey, look, your inactivity is not going to solve any problems here. So like you owe it to the world to get out there and like try your best at something, anything, anything, because, you know, I I mean, I don't I don't want to be complacent in this thing called life. Mm. Um, I want to I want to do something that's going to be impactful and that's going to matter and that's going to help people, you know, that's going to leave some kind of legacy. Um, so at 19, you know, what am I waiting for? Why am I wasting time? Go get to work. Like, <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> I, I think you still have a lot of time on the horizon and you're making some great, great strides. But I, I appreciate what you're saying about uh, finding that passion and that focus to drive something forward and and make an impact. And I, I think that you that you're doing that. And I I hope that you'll continue to do that. And uh, with that, I want to thank you so much for joining us on our Onside podcast today. If uh, if folks are interested in learning more about uh, Colorsmith or the company, what's the best way that they can follow you or all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so uh, we do have a Twitter. So it's Colorsmith uh, Labs, um, C-O-L-O-U-R, spelled the Canadian way. But honestly, the best way to, to come and talk to me is to shoot me an email. Let's go out for a coffee. That's always my favorite. I agree. Yeah, so my email... Um, my email is gabrielle at colorsmith.com. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Gabrielle, so much for sharing your story with us today. Our listeners really enjoyed hearing your great insights and your experience with your company, Colorsmith. So exciting to hear about that. I also want to thank our audience for tuning in and listening to the Onside podcast. And for more information on innovation-driven entrepreneurship, feel free to subscribe to our podcast and share it. And to see some of the pictures that Gabrielle was talking about at her apartment lab, check out our Onside Twitter, which is at Onside Now. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining, and we look forward to having you listen in on our next podcast. Thank you.